You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. So this week's episode is a little bit different to other episodes because it's a redo, a redux, a remake, a re-something. And the reason I've done this is, one, I didn't have enough time to finish my research because I have been very sick. Sorry. And point two is, I've been saying for a long time that I wanted to redo some of these episodes, especially those that had lower quality audio-wise. Because the amount of times I have people who start listening to the podcast and then they're like, oh no, the sound's really bad or I can't really hear this. And I'm like, I get it, I do. And I already redid Granular Wheel, even though I didn't even do that with the best quality, but I, I remade that out of spite. And I wanted to go back to something which I completely buggered up on the first time, which was this episode. Because if you actually listen to it, there's so much information and I'm so desperate to get the information out. And at the time, I was so worried about talking any more than like 30 minutes. Like I was so worried about going over that 30 minute mark that I was freaking the hell out. And so I'm talking so fast, like so ridiculously fast. It's 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 as if it's on double speed. But no, that's just me. Like, that was just my voice. That was just me that day. And I feel I feel like you deserve better as an audience, as listeners, as followers. And so here I am, remaking this because I fucking care. Which now leads me into the disclaimer. If you are new here, hello, welcome, mazel tov. Please consider this your official warning that my language on here, like my attitude, can get a wee bit salty and as such it's probably best if you do not like uh, any expletives or cussing, cursing or swear words, probably best to exit stage left now. And now that that's over with, welcome to the Guild of Historical Descent and I shall be your guide through the rabbit hole. Not like the rabbit because he was too busy running around um, panicked about how late he was for everything. Which is, which is also me, I guess. Um, yeah. And in a move that surprises absolutely fucking no one, yet again someone has complained. It was a dude, okay? It was a dude who complained. That I don't talk enough about men on my podcast. Yes, I was silent for a moment for dramatic effect. Oh, by the old gods and the new, grant me the confidence of a mediocre white man, I swear. I just, like, I'm sorry, was I loud on my podcast that I research, record and edit myself? I'm sorry, did I use my skills and expertise to discuss areas in which I... I'm an expert. I'm I'm sorry. Like Okay. Cool. You do you boo, but like the fucking audacity of it all. I just it bothers me, right? Oh, it shouldn't, right? I should be used to it. Which leads me to something that I really want to talk about. And so I'm gonna have to give some context to this. So I had made a video about the Donner Party and how like one of the main contributing factors to them, you know dying and cannibalizing each other was racism right it was you know and so someone this dude made a comment something along the lines of oh well you know clearly they deserved it haha and it was some kind of joke it was in poor taste and i was like children died like infants like small children died like this isn't okay Like, they didn't deserve this. You don't get to say shit like this. Like, do your fucking research. And, um, and so he said something else in response to it. 
And I was like, and that gets you blocked, right? Um, I actually think I mentioned this before because it was a dude uh, from, he was the co-host of some podcast, apparently. I don't know who he was. I still don't know who he is. Clearly, I've forgotten his name. That's how important he was to me. And I just, I was just blocked done. And this woman comments afterwards going, oh, why are you so sensitive? It's the internet. Fucking not. Sorry for the loudness in your ears, anyone who's got headphones on. But no, absolutely fucking not. Just because it's on the internet does not make it acceptable. Just because you're hiding behind a screen does not make your actions any less reprehensible. You should be judged for what you say and do there. I don't care, right? I mean, there's joking and there, there's stuff and there's camaraderie and there's things that are okay and there, there's a level to it, right? Like, there's a time and a place for that and it all works within its specific bubble, right? I mean, there's times where I've had to explain to other people that, like, people are not insulting me, they are my friends and they are joking. But people have a habit of treating the internet as if it's some sort of purge zone where you can do and say whatever you like and not have to suffer any consequences of it. But that's not the case. You don't have to tolerate anything anybody says to you. You don't have to argue with people who are being arseholes. You can block them. They do not have the right to have to be in your space. Like, they don't need to be there. You don't have to have them there. And you don't have to tolerate their bullshit. It is perfectly acceptable to just get them the fuck out of your space. Just because it's the internet. Just because it's the comment section on a news article. Just because it's a social media page. Just because it's Discord. It doesn't fucking matter. You don't need to tolerate that shit. Get the fuck out, pal. But I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, quit your jibber jabber, and fact me, in fact you I will. But first, I've got to get my source on. Our sources are shark arm, a shark, a tattooed arm, and two unsolved murders, by Philip Roop and Kevin Marr. Shark arm murder, 1935, by the New South Wales Dictionary of Sydney. The shark arm case by Vince Kelly. The Shark Arm Murders by Alex Castles. And of course we have articles from the papers The Sydney Truth and The Sydney Morning Herald. I was it uncomfortably? Good. Then let's begin. So I'm not entirely sure how many true crime cases involve sharks. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the number is. In fact, I've never actually looked, but if somebody knows... If there is a marine biologist who is also into historical crime and would like to inform me of, you know, how many sharks have been involved in murders? I mean, I don't think they were involved in the planning of it. I feel like humans were probably in charge of that. But the sharks were kind of accessories? Tools? And I feel like accessory to murder is a bit harsh to lay on a shark. I mean crime sharks. No, let's not get into that right now. We don't need to be sidetracked this early on. So it's 1935 in Australia. It's winter there or coming into winter. I guess their seasons are the other way, but yet still really fucking warm because it's Australia and it just likes to be toasty down there or at least toasty in comparison to, you know, cold, dreary, wet Ireland, where I am from. I love Ireland. Please don't kick me out of the country. I like it here. Back to Australia. It's the 17th of April, 1935, and a fisherman is out fishing, as fishermen are wont to do, out just off the coast of Coogie Beach. And he hooks himself a wee shark. And he's thinking, that's a wee treat. That's a nice wee shark, that. And then... What comes along and guzzles up the wee shark? But a four-foot tiger shark. As Qui-Gon Jinn says in Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, there's always a bigger fish. That is an absolutely shocking Liam Neeson impression. I would like to personally apologise to Liam Neeson or anyone who knows him personally. If, for some reason, if he ever has to listen to this podcast or this sound clip, if that ever occurs, I'm so sorry. That was shit. <laughs> but yeah, 
instead of getting rid of this big fish, instead of just dumping it, which is what the fisherman could have done, because he's hooked the wee shark, right? And then the big tiger shark has, like, literally swallowed the wee shark, you know, like like a really shit Russian doll. And so these two are stuck together. And he's like, well, this shark is still alive and Anzac Day is coming up in, like, eight, eight, eight days. And so he's like, yeah, this will be a really fun, cool thing to, like, show off at the aquarium or something. Like, this will be fun for Anzac Day. So for those of you who don't know... Anzac Day is celebrated on the 25th of April every single year and they've been doing it since 1915 and it's to commemorate and celebrate and revere all of the Australian and New Zealand forces, people who had served in the forces but like originally its main sort of commemoration was the landing at Gallipoli during World War I which just so happened to be one of the worst military assaults of the First World War. Uh, Winston Churchill, he powered through with this plan that was never going to work out of sheer stubbornness and he basically used the Anzac forces as fodder even though there was no way they could have won due to just hubris and other such bullshit. But yes, Anzac Day was to commemorate the landing and the lives that were lost and those who served during this. So yeah, Anzac Day is approaching and Bert Hobson, the fisherman, he's like, ding, 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 ding. This is going to be great. Haul the tiger shark in and it can be exhibited at the Kugi Aquarium and Swimming Baths, which just so happened to be owned by Hobson's brother. In fact, it was a pretty easy sell. Because at this point in time, like for the past few months, the shark was effectively public enemy number one in New South Wales. Because I think like three fellas had been gotten by sharks. And so there was like a big manhunt, a manhunt, shark hunt going on. They were basically, they were basically not cool with sharks. And here is a massive bloody tiger shark just dossing about in a swimming pool. And for the first few days, the shark seems to be enjoying its new habitat, right? It's eating, I mean, it's like ravenous, like it's consistently hungry, but it's a shark. Are sharks not like always hungry? Again, not a marine biologist. So the shark starts off being full of beans, swimming about, eating stuff, just living its best shark life, you know, for an animal in captivity. But then by Anzac Day, when the place is packed, because everybody wants to see this fucking shark, right? It is getting sluggish. It's not swimming the way it used to. And then, in front of this massive crowd, the shark starts to vomit. Like, up until this point, I was not aware sharks could vomit. Because, like, rats don't vomit. Well, actually, no rodent vomits, like, at all. So, like, rats, squirrels, mice, beavers, gophers other rodents that I don't know the name of. Chinchillas? Are chinchillas rodents? I don't... I don't know. But yeah, it's why rat poison works. Because rodents don't have gag reflexes. And I I know it's a kind of weird assumption to make, but I, I just sort of assumed that something living in the sea, in the water, also wouldn't have a gag reflex and would not puke. But as it turns out, it does! And so there's this 14-foot tiger shark in front of this massive crowd of people and it's kind of getting drippy and slow and then it starts frothing at the mouth and it's brown and it is repugnant. It is just a putrid smell of this brown, bubbly, frothy goo. And it just starts chucking up. It's regurgitating this. Just like lumps of dirt and sand and other just kind of brown muck. It also vomits up a rat, a bird and a human arm with a piece of rope tied to it. Here's the thing. Finding an arm inside a shark is suspicious enough, right? A whole arm. Yeah. 
but when it has a piece of rope attached, I feel like some calls need to be made. Naturally, people are shocked because this is a weird thing to happen. And, you know, everyone's kind of hoping tragic accident. You know, maybe someone was swimming and then they got eaten by a shark. You know, like, things happen. Like, it's Australia. Most of the wildlife is trying to kill you, apart from the koalas, which are just trying to give you chlamydia. But anyway, seeing as this incident falls under the category of weird as shit, the police are called in, and so they bring with them a coroner and a shark expert. Because they want to just confirm, you know, their suspicions, because they're thinking, again, tragic accident, the sharks have already been eating people off the bay, we know of at least three lives lost, and they're thinking this is probably just another one of those. Alas, this was not the case, because upon closer inspection, it was very apparent that this arm had not been bitten off. Oh no, it had been severed with a sharp implement of some kind, but like, not clean enough to be a surgical procedure, like it was far too crude, or like like a hack or a sawing motion. There was no way this was done by a medical professional. And I'd be really worried if it was, because it really would call into question the disposal method for, like, amputees' body parts. Like, what? into the sea? So the shark expert agrees with the coroner, you know, that this arm has definitely not been chomped off by a shark, probably because of the lack of chomping marks and, you know, the sawing marks that were on it. But also, in addition, furthermore, because of how acidic the gastric juices are in a shark, like, they were able to sort of guesstimate when the arm had been consumed. So how long that arm had been in the shark's stomach. Which gives them a starting point, or more like an ending point, really, for their timeline. Because this arm was in the shark between eight and 18 days. Meaning that it was quite possible that this arm had been consumed by the shark just before it was caught. And so begins the investigation. Because although the authorities did not have much to go on, this much they were sure of. The owner of this arm suffered a severe case of the martos. Like I said, they didn't really have much to go on. But luckily, this arm, this forearm, had a very distinctive tattoo of two boxers sparring. So distinctive, in fact, that after seeing a report in a Sydney newspaper, The Sydney Truth, the police get a phone call from one Edwin Smith, who very casually informs them that the tattoo and the severed arm, respectively, belong to his brother, James Smith, but his friends call him Jim. And in a crazy random happenstance, Jim, as it turns out, has been missing for weeks. His brother has not seen Hyde nor hear of him. So after the brother phones in and is like fairly certain that the tattoo slash arm belonged to his, you know, missing brother Jim, they then bring in Gladys Smith, Jim's wife, to identify the body uh, part. In another serendipitous turn of events, the arm is so well preserved that they are able to collect fingerprints. Which is very lucky because they happen to have Jim Smith's fingerprints on file. But why oh why does this 1930s Sydney police force have Jim Smith's fingerprints on file? Well, let me tell you a wee bit about Jim. Jim was a bankrupt builder, ex-boxer, ex-bookie and a small-time criminal with a wee record of minor convictions. He wasn't quite in the underworld, wasn't exactly rubbing shoulders with the criminal elite. He was more, say, underworld adjacent. And the current pie he had his fingers in was an illegal gambling ring that was happening at the time. And so the police start digging, and it doesn't take them long to discover that the last time Jim Smith was seen, he was playing dominoes with his long-time buddy, 
and expert forger Patrick Brady. The two cuddly cons had been seen together at the Cecil Hotel in Cronu. They had been drinking and playing dominoes, and so they were hanging out there for a bit before heading back to Gunamata Bay, because Brady had been renting a cottage there. And this just so happens to be the very last time that anybody remembers seeing Jim Smith. Now, the very next morning, Patrick Brady gets a taxi, a Cronulla cabbie, to be exact, who takes him all the way from Gunamata Bay to North Sydney and drops him right outside the door of <coughs> businessman Reginald Lloyd Holmes. See this Cronulla cabbie? He's a decent citizen. He's got absolutely nothing to fucking hide. And so he comes forward and he tells the police that when he picked up Brady, he's all dishevelled, his clothes are all kind of like wrong. He's acting weird. He's shaking. He's acting jumpy and paranoid. Like he's worried someone is following him. Like this cabbie is no stranger to like weird and creepy behaviour because, you know, He's a cabbie in the 1930s. But what he notices and what he finds like really bloody peculiar is that Patrick Brady will not take his hand out of his pocket and he was holding something. Like this was a very deep, deep pocket and he was gripping something in it and he was not taking his hand out. Listen, I don't care how much good you see in the world. I don't care how positive you are or how gullible you are. But when a dishevelled, jumpy, paranoid, known criminal travels all the way from Gunamata Bay all the way up to North Sydney, by taxi, by taxi. I mean, this is a journey that is over 35 kilometres long. It's over 21 miles for people who don't use the metric system but it's it's a long time it's a 52 I mean it's a 52 minute journey now back then cars would be like slower so I assume it'd be like over an hour back then like in a taxi like that's not a cheap fare so this is a long ass journey by a known criminal who's acting if I dare say it really fucking suspicious and he gets dropped off Outside the home of a, well, supposed respected businessman who, as I'm sure you have guessed, is anything but. That's right, Reginald William Lloyd Holmes. I mean, generally when you have that many names, you're either posh or a knob. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. So yes, this seemingly respectable entrepreneur was, well, yeah, nothing of the sort. Holmes was the ringleader of a smuggling ring. A smuggling ring that used speedboats that had been built in Holmes's own boat building business. Apparently, building boats and speedboats wasn't lucrative enough for Reginald here he clearly needed to supplement his income, and so he gets a side hustle in smuggling. But what has this got to do with Jim Smith and his missing arm? Well, both Jim Smith and Patrick Brady were what you might call seasonal employees of Mr. Holmes here. They would, on occasion, drive the speedboats during these smuggling jobs. What's funny to me about this, which is like, not funny, haha, but kind of is, is that the method of smuggling that they use in this 1930s historical crime case is still the method for smuggling shit today. Like, drugs have washed up on the beaches here because of this method. Like, you'd think over time that it would evolve, that they would make it work better, but no. No, apparently, 1930s is where it stopped. That's that's the best way for transporting the contraband. So, like, what they would do, I should probably explain, what they would do was, the packages of illegal goods, the cocaine, the cigarettes, and other such illegal goods, I mean, it's Australia, 
oranges can sometimes be illegal there. Clearly, they have always had incredibly strict regulations regarding the import of goods. So yeah, ships that were passing by, they would chuck these packages of contraband overboard and they would basically be buoyant, right? So they would float atop the water. And then Jim Smith or whatever other dog's body he had driving the boat that night would go pick up said package, just scoop it out of the water in their fancy speedboat and then bring it back to shore so that Reginald's like other lackeys could then distribute said goods. So Jim Smith, he's got the high risk position, yeah? High risk, low yield. He's out there risking getting caught by the police, the coast guards, other criminals who want in on the action. And so this is, this is his role. That's his bit, right? And Brady, remember, Patrick Brady, he's a forger. So he's he's got a different role to play in this. But this does seem to be where Patrick Brady and Jim Smith cross paths. And this is where they start getting involved in stuff together. So on top of the, you know, smuggling and drug running, they're involved in insurance scams, the gruesome twosome. So they end up basically running a bunch of insurance scams for Reginald. And so they would commit everyone's second favourite crime, arson. They would intentionally set fire to, or, you know, just plain old sink, Reginald's boats, and then he would collect the insurance money. So they would do, you know, the general rigmarole. They would have fake documentation, sort of fake bits and pieces. They would destroy older or damaged boats and then pretend they were, like, the newer ones. It's good old-fashioned fraud, just like Grandma used to make. So the police, they start piecing this together and they come to the conclusion that being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. There was a botched job here somewhere. Like the fraud, the insurance, the scam... Something went wrong, it failed, and a disagreement was had. And as such, the clear resolution to this issue was murder, I guess. So this insurance scam, it goes awry. You know, something doesn't work out and the insurance company doesn't cough up. So yeah, it didn't work out. And that happens sometimes. Not every single criminal endeavour is going to give you the results you want. You know, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And that's something that you really should, you know, take on board. You know, whether you're learning a new skill or, you know, defrauding insurance companies for buckets of money. And like, this seems, you know, a fair thing to have happened. Like, disagreements happen, people stop working together. You know, when something goes wrong, it it can happen. But, murder does seem like a wee bit of a jump. Like, maybe don't work together, maybe blackball them from the community a wee bit. But murder? Like, these are seasoned criminals. Like, this is a forger, for fuck's sake. Like, you would aim for something that would, you know, benefit you. I mean, you don't go into forgery to not benefit. Like, how does killing someone benefit you? 
So a theory does emerge and it's that Smith, Jim Smith, was blackmailing Reginald William Lloyd Holmes about the insurance scam. And because he was blackmailing him and, you know, trying to get money, that then Holmes uses Brady to off him. One lackey get rid of another lackey. Like, plan. And so the police are, if nothing else, highly suspicious. And so Patrick Brady and Reginald William Lloyd Holmes are taken in for questioning. Remember, they have no concrete evidence at this point. Everything they have, this entire case, it's circumstantial. So they need evidence. At the very least, they need one of these bastards to talk. But as soon as they get in there, Holmes is like, Brady who? New telegram. Who this? I would now like to formally apologise to the entirety of Australia. That, that I cannot do accents. I don't know why I try. They're so bad. They're so bad. Um, but yeah, Reginald Holmes, he's like, uh, new telegram, who this? That is, that's also a really bad joke. I'm so sorry. I made you suffer through that, but I've made you do it now. So we're just going to power through. But yeah, the police are convinced that both of these men are involved in this, but they only really have enough evidence for Brady. And because both of them refuse to cooperate... Brady ends up charged with the murder and is basically being pushed to confess. And Reginald William Lloyd Holmes, well, he doesn't know the men. He doesn't know Patrick Brady. He never knew Jem Smith. They can't prove he did. And so he walks away scot-free. I can tell, gentle listener, that you're shocked, shocked and aghast, I say, that a rich, middle-aged white man got away with a crime? I know, right? Shocking. Reginald is free as a bird. Brady is not talking. And just when it feels like the case has hit an apparent dead end, Okay, like, how do I, how do I put this? Okay, um, total nonsensical tomfuckery, right? Dude is in the clear. They have nothing on him. And then, on the 20th of May, 1935, Mr. Reginald William Lloyd Holmes makes a break in the case with a fucking speedboat. Because what he does is he absolutely shoots out of his boat shed into the harbour on one of his very fast, very special speedboats. Reginald here, he takes the boat out to Lavender Bay. He pulls out a pistol and attempts to die by suicide. However, this doesn't quite pan out for Reginald here. So... He shoots himself in the head, but he doesn't die because the bullet, it is such a small caliber bullet that it just flattens once it hits him in the head and it just stuns him. See, it's information like this which really makes me consider things like the attempted assassination of Rasputin. Like, we shot him and he didn't die. How big were the bullets actually? Like... What calibre were they? Did he have very strong bones? Like, this is... These are questions we must ask, don't you think? But anyway, yeah. Back to Reginald William Lloyd Holmes, right? He has stunned himself with a bullet and fallen off the side of the ship. He's gone overboard and into the water. But, weirdly, serendipitously, I guess for Reginald... Or, or not, or for the police, for somebody. Reginald, he falls into the water. He is stunned. But as he falls, a rope catches around his wrist. Not only keeping Reginald connected 
to his boat, but this prevents him from sinking beneath the waves and drowning. Because as well, when he lands in the water, the shock of it sort of revives him. So if he had just fallen into the water and wasn't attached to the boat, the panic could have very easily made him sink further. Because when you have that amount of tension in you, like that's where you go down, as opposed to relaxing your body and floating. So yeah, he's had a bit of a shock with the water. He's he's alert and he manages to scramble back on board the boat. Clearly at this point, Reginald is not in the most logical of head spaces. And when he manages to sort of clamber back on the boat, he quickly discovers that, you know, people saw this happen. They were onlookers and they have called the authorities. That's right, somebody called the water police. And, uh, yeah, not being of the soundest of minds, Reginald goes, fuck this for a game of soldiers, and goes pedal to the metal. And he just tries to straight up flee. So the water police, they give chase. And, like, they somehow manage to relatively keep up with him, because, remember, he is in his very fast, very special speedboat. Like... This is tip-top. This is his, like, pièce de résistance. Like, and he is being chased by the cops. And so he is gain at Laldi. So they chase the man, the police, the water police. They are just Benny Hilling it. Just following this dude for four full hours. So... They go out past Circular Quay, somehow managing to not collide with any of the the morning ferry traffic because this is a busy bay. Like, it's, it's a busy area. There's a lot of water traffic. This is not a quiet area. Like, this is not a safe place to be zipping about in a speedboat, let alone having an aquatic chase. So, yeah... They've come out of Lavender Bay, up past Circular Quay, right down Sydney Harbour, and finally, finally, around about the Sydney Heads, he gives up. Did he run out of fuel? Did the adrenaline wear off? Did he have a massive headache from flattening a bullet against his cranium? Did he come to the conclusion that no matter how fast his wee speedboat was, he was not going to outrun the many water police vessels that were chasing him. Him's to say. So Reginald, he's given himself up and the water police not being total fucking dickheads, at least bring him to the hospital first. And after Mr. Holmes recuperates, words are had. Well, I mean, at first he tries to say that he was attacked at home, he was shot and that he fled and then he saw the water police and he thought the water police were the people who tried to shoot him. Like, he confused the water police for rampant criminals who had attacked him, a kind and regular legal businessman in his own home. But of course, that wasn't the case. But it is at this point, my dear guys, gals, and non-binary pals, that the plot thickens. So they arrest Reginald William Lloyd Holmes. You're like, why do you say his full name all the time? Because I just like to remind us how much of a shitbag this fellow is. Like, I just like to, to keep you informed. So they arrest him. And he, my dear friends, ends up singing like a fucking canary. He's got places, he's got dates, he's got names, and he is absolutely ready to squawk on Patrick Brady. Reginald claims that Patrick Brady killed Smith for reasons, and that he had dismembered him and given him what is known in the criminal circles as a Sydney send-off. Effectively, this is hacking up a body, putting the parts inside of trunks, and then dumping the aforementioned trunks off of Gutamana Bay. 
And again, according to Reginald, Patrick Brady gave Jim Smith a Sydney send-off and then showed up at his house with Jim Smith's very, as we've said before, very distinctive tattooed arm. And then he threatened Holmes. He threatened him and demanded £500. And naturally, Reginald William Lloyd Holmes, he doesn't want to be dismembered by a petty criminal, his body parts chucked in a trunk and then buried at sea. Of course not. So naturally, he pays him off and afterwards Brady takes the arm with him, ties a weight to it and throws it into the ocean. And it was after this and seeing no way out that he had decided to do what he did on the speedboat. Now, at this point, Reggie, he is ready and willing to testify in court. He agrees absolutely 100%. And at this point, it seems like the case is cut and dry. But then, another twist in the tale. It's the 12th of June. It's 20 past one in the morning, so 1.20am. It is literally hours away. Hours away from Jim Smith's inquest. So the inquest into the murder of Jim Smith, at which Reginald Holmes was supposed to be providing testimony. A couple hours. Early hours of the morning. Reginald William Lloyd Holmes, his car is found at this abandoned docks down at Dawes Point. And the car, from a distance, it looks like it's just been abandoned, right? But no, inside, slumped over the steering wheel of the car, was the body of Reginald William Lloyd Holmes, with three bullet wounds in his chest. Now I'm going to pepper this sandwich of mystery with just a sprinkling of intrigue. So the very day before the inquest was supposed to occur, so a couple hours before the body is found, Reginald goes to the bank and he withdraws £500. Now, this is the amount that he says Patrick Brady asked for. So he takes out £500 and that's like, um, what was it now, in, in today's money, that's like £36. £6,000, um, €40,000, um, 65000 Australian dollars, or like 48000 US dollars. So this is the 11th of June, and so he's withdrawn the money, like earlier in the day, and then in the evening, he tells his wife that he has to go meet someone. And, you know, she's not suspicious, it doesn't seem peculiar, but he goes to meet someone, or so he tells her, And then a few hours later, he's found dead. Like, I'm not a lead, you know, criminal investigator or, or, I don't know, police authority person. But I feel like the main witness to your murder inquest should probably receive, like, a wee bit of police protection. Especially, you know, the night leading up to said incredibly important murder inquest. But back to the crime scene. Now, again, I'm not a criminologist. I'm not a forensic criminal person. But, like, the ongoing theory here that they have at this moment in time at the crime scene is that Reginald William Lloyd Holmes died by suicide. By shooting himself in the chest three times. Now... Even the most determined of people, like after you shoot yourself in the chest once, are you really going to go to the effort of shooting yourself in the chest two more times? Like, are you going to do it? Like, the money isn't found in the car. Yeah. And he's just, like, they find the the weapon, but they kind of, it's like, oh yeah, he definitely did this to himself. Which is, mm, mm weird and doesn't make sense to me. Another theory is that he took out the money to put a hit on himself 
to protect his family. Like, because he's, you know, a member of the criminal underworld and there are other people that are are having it out for him that are going to come and get him and also, you know, because he, he gobbed to the police. Like, it's, you know. So there's this whole idea that he did this to protect them. Now, another contributing factor is that if his crimes were out in the open, if he testified, you know, on the Bible, to the open court, that he would lose his livelihood, his reputation, and that his family would have to suffer embarrassment. So it's not just about, like, physically protecting them, but, like, protecting them financially. Because he also left, like, an estate worth, like, £36,000 at the time, which is just a lot a lot of money like millions I suppose in today's money like just a good hunk of change and that's like one of the prevailing theories that he takes his head out on himself in order to you know just ensure like a decent life for his family you know another theory is that you know Patrick Brady sort of put a head out on him and he was murdered to silence him Because, yeah, he's the primary witness. It definitely feels like it's a hit of some kind. But who orchestrated it? We, We just don't know. So, yeah, with the unfortunate end of Reginald here, Jim Smith's inquest no longer has a primary witness. There's no one really to testify at this point. And because of this, the trial lasts, like, two days. Two days tops for a murder inquest. Because, you know, there's no relevant witnesses left. And so, because the case against Patrick Brady is effectively circumstantial, the case just crumbles. And he gets to stroll out of the court, probably doing, I don't know, whatever dance was popular at the time. The Charleston, maybe? Jiving? I don't know, what. when's the... 1930s version of dabbing like that's twice i've mentioned dabbing in a in an episode somebody get me off the internet i i need to stop talking about these things that i am not having any wherewithal of because everything everything against him was circumstantial the only thing they had the only solid piece of evidence was jim's arm so yeah brady is acquitted of all charges but unfortunately for him, um, his Charleston, his driving, his Susieing, they come to an abrupt stop because as soon as he's outside the court, as soon as they get a chance, he's arrested on forgery charges because they can get him for that. But yeah, for Patrick Brady for the next 30 years, up until his death in 1965, he proclaims his innocence in the murder. He's like, he wasn't involved. Jimmy Smith was his friend. And he didn't kill him. I mean, obviously, we're going to take that with a pinch of salt. But, like, hmm, maybe. That being said, after the trial, after the dust settles, some information starts to trickle out. And, oh, this stew that we are mixing. Like, your your spoon is fighting you at this point. Like, this wooden spoon is about to snap. That is how much this plot has thickened, okay? This witch's brew, just, it's not going any further. As it turns out, our dear friend Jimmy Smith was a fizz gig. Now, if you're an Australian person who knows 1930s, you know, slang, you won't have to look that up. I am not that person. And so I did. A fizz gig is a police informant. So, Jimmy Smith. Police informant, which makes the, uh, mm, quote unquote, rat was caught and dealt with. Snitches get stitches, bitches. Well, I mean, less snitches get stitches and more like snitches get hacked up and served to the sharks. But what, what perplexes me, again, not a criminality criminologist person sorry it's very late when i'm recording this uh what is confusing to me is that jimmy smith jim smith 
Jamesy boy, Jim Jiminy Jim Jiminy Jim Jim, is a distinct looking man. He has a very distinct tattoo, a very distinct tattoo that was shown in the newspaper, that was shown to the police force. To the police force of which he was a police informant and not one police officer recognised this very distinctive tattoo. Like, no one recognised the name Jimmy Smith. Like, not one person, not one single solitary member of the police force went, I know him, that's the guy who's been dobbing on everyone. I'm not saying it's suspicious, I'm just saying, you know, it's fucking suspicious. So, word on the street is that Jimmy the Fizzer snitched. He snitched on a guy called Eddie Wayman, and Wayman and his pal were caught red-handed robbing a bank. And, again, the rule is don't squeal to the pigs. Like, that's... I mean, that's kind of like a general, like, rule for, like, life. But it's very much the golden rule of being part of the criminal underworld. And there's also a theory this is all part of some, like, Razorhurst gang war. But yeah, we, we don't really have evidence one way or the other for that. And so ends the tale of the Sydney shark arm murder. So what did we learn today? We learned that having the fastest speedboat doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win the race. Um, and that one arm does not a corpse make. So I hope you liked my retelling of uh, my retelling of my retelling of the Sydney Shark Arm murder. If you'd like to rate and review five stars, that would be awesome sauce. I would love that. Um, don't forget you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, X, I guess it's called now. Uh, I'm on Patreon. I've got PayPal if you want to donate to the tip jar and keep me an Advil in research money. Listen, subscriptions to vintage newspapers are not cheap. I spend so much time reading tiny, tiny print. Uh, all the links are in the description down below. And I guess it is recommendation time. Da 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 da. God, I'm tired. <laughs> um, recommendations. You know, um, I think everybody needs to feel good sometimes and I'm not going to recommend anything new because of you know sag after and whatnot so I am going to recommend Dumpling everybody should watch Dumpling it is so good it's on Netflix it is just it's just a wonderful movie go watch it it's brilliant go watch it um for reading I am going to suggest the Christie Affair it's sort of um it's, it's like a fictional retelling of the chain of events that led up to the mysterious disappearance of Agatha Christie, which is not as mysterious if you like just look at it very reasonably. But yeah, and for listening, uh, well, 1989 Taylor's version should be coming out very soon. Although I have been listening to Speak Now and Mean is so good. I love that it's just like the most country song. Uh, is And it's just pure spite. And I love it because it's like adorable spite. But yeah. And so that's my recommendations. And so with that, I shall say good night to you. Adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friends. Uh, bye bye.